Good morning, everyone. How are you? Thanks, Carla, for uh, getting us started. Um, and thanks to CU for having us. Um, our panel will, like Carla said, will be discussing uh, protecting the tribal relationship to native lands and waters. Uh, we have five outstanding panelists that will provide us uh, some unique insight into that topic. Um, because we have one of the larger panels, we decided we're going to have more of a roundtable discussion and open discussion uh, around our topic. Um, so we don't really have any PowerPoints or um, any materials to provide up here, but there is materials in the CLE information um, packet of information. So without that, without further ado, I'll get uh, introduce the panelists and we'll get started. So first in the uh, middle, we have uh, Chairman Don Gentry, who you all uh, heard speak this morning. Uh, Chairman Gentry lives in Chiloquin, Oregon. He was born in April 26, 1955 in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Uh, having been raised by his father as a Klamath tribal hunter and fisherman, he's very knowledgeable of the fish and wildlife resources throughout South Central Oregon where Klamath tribal members continue to exercise their tribal treaty rights and traditional cultural practices within the former Klamath Indian Reservation. Prior to becoming the chairman in May of 2013, Don worked for the Klamath tribes for 25 years as the Klamath tribes natural resource specialist and served as the vice chairman from 2010 to 2013. Uh, next we have uh, Dr. Suzanne Schoen Harjo. She's Cheyenne and Muskogee and she is the president of the Morningstar Institute in Washington, D.C. She's also a poet, a writer, curator, lecturer, and policy advocate who has helped Native peoples protect sacred places and recover more than a million acres of Native land. She has developed key laws in five decades to promote and protect Native nations, sovereignty, children, arts, cultures, land, languages, religious freedom, repatriation, sacred places, and water. She's also a founder of the National Museum of the American Indian. And just last year, President Obama presented her with a 2014 Presidential Medal of Freedom in a White House ceremony honoring only 18 recipients. The medal is the United States' highest civilian honor. She's also, she was also the lead plaintiff in Harjo et al. versus Pro Football, the landmark lawsuit against, uh, to cancel the trademarks for a disparaging name of the Washington, Washington Professional Football Franchise. Hey. Next, we have Don Miller, second from the end. Uh, before starting his own firm in 2001, Mr. Miller was an attorney with NARF uh, in Washington, D.C. and Boulder for 27 years. Mr. Miller has represented tribal clients before the Supreme Court, federal appellate and district courts, the Court of Federal Claims, Congress, federal agencies and state courts and legislatures. His practice has focused on land claims and reserved water rights claims where congressional implementation of consensual settlement agreements was the preferred outcome. He's also served as lead counsel in a variety of matters, including tribal claims to unextinguished aboriginal and recognized title, federal reserved water rights, treaty hunting and fishing rights, sovereign immunity, congressional restoration of the federal trust relationship with terminated tribes, fee to trust acquisitions with carcieri issues, navigable waters, taxation, jurisdiction, voting rights, and FERC relicensing. Next here, next to Suzanne, we have uh, Professor Robert Anderson. He is a professor and director of the Native American Law Center at the University of Washington School of Law and is the Oneida Indian Visiting Professor of Law at Harvard Law School where he teaches annually. He is a co-author and a member of the board of editors of Cohen's Federal uh, Cohen's Handbook of Federal Indian Law in 2005 and 2012, and he is the co-author of Anderson, Berger, Fricke, and Krakoff, American Indian Law Cases and Commentary. He spent 12 years as a staff attorney uh, with NARF, where he litigated major cases involving sovereignty and natural resources. From 95 until 2001, he served as a political appointee in the Clinton administration under then Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt, providing legal and policy advice on a wide variety of Indian law and natural resources issues. And finally, uh, at the end there is Steve Moore. 
He's an attorney with NARF, and prior to joining NARF, Steve was a, an attorney representing tribes and individual Indians in uh, northern Idaho, and he also represented the, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes of Montana. As a NARF staff attorney, Steve has represented tribes on complex litigation involving treaty fishing rights and implied federal Indian reserve water rights, including the Nez Perce tribe in Idaho, Agua Caliente Band in California, Tule River tribe in California, and the Kickapoo tribe in Kansas in water litigation and settlement negotiations. He's also worked to protect sacred lands and worked on repatriation of human remains and the protection of unmarked native graves the religious use of peyote, and the religious rights of native prisoners. So that is our distinguished panel. And like I mentioned, uh, we're going to have more of a roundtable type discussion because of our large panel. And so I wanted to start out with uh, Chairman Gentry and uh, Suzanne Harjo to kind of set the stage for us um, to talk about protecting the tribal relationship to native lands and water. And so before we really uh, jump in to talk about protecting that relationship, I think it's important to understand what the relationship is and the importance uh, of the native lands and water to our tribal members. So um, Chairman Gentry and Suzanne, if you could um, jump in and, and talk about the importance of, of land and waters to our people, uh, the meaning of it to our people and then the spiritual connection that um, our members have to land and waters. One time when we were doing resolutions at the National Congress of American Indians in the early 1970s, the room became divided, lawyers here and Indians over here even though some of the lawyers were Indians. <coughs> and the word that kept being thrown around was pursuant, pursuant, pursuant. And finally, one of the traditional people from the Northwest Coast said, okay, we start this resolution pursuant only to the Creator. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> and I thought that was a wonderful blend of um, uh, what we've really done, I think, in, in uh, the latter half of the 1900s and uh, in this part of the 2000s. Uh, we have blended traditional wisdom and uh, savvy with um, uh, lawyers, learned traditional wisdom and savvy. And that really is what NARF does. A lot of people who were in the federal Indian bar, who thought they were the federal Indian bar, uh, non-native lawyers working in Washington, D.C. for the most part, did not respect Indian lawyers. And one example of that is um, when I was at the National Congress of American Indians, uh, not as director, which I was in the 80s, but in the 70s, um, for a while I was communications director and legislative assistant, and I was in charge of uh, organizing the National Indian Litigation Committee. So we chose, uh, of course, the director of NARF and the director of ALTIP and the director of the um, American Indian Law Center to be on the, on the um, group of lawyers. Uh, it was a lawyers and tribal leaders committee. And immediately the, the white guys who represented NCAI uh, said that they would call in the debt that NCAI had. Um, to their firm, uh, which was about $30,000, which NCAI did not have, uh, if any of the, those Indian lawyers were put on the committee. And what he said was that um, the Indian lawyers simply don't have the seasoning, the experience, the knowledge, the know-how. 
And Tom Fredericks, uh, as director of NARF, I mean, I told on them. You know, sometimes all you can do is tell on them. <laughs> so <laughs> they're holding uh, uh, NCAI hostage. And um, uh, so Tom got furious and, and uh, did what he did very well, which was to um, uh, make his case. And we had a compromise, which was that the organizations, uh, NARF leading them, uh, would be the advisory uh, Indian organizations to the litigation committee, which turned out to be a better uh, construction anyway. And um, so that's where things were in, as far as respect for Indian lawyers in, in the uh, mid-1970s, uh, 1975 to be exact. And I have to say that, that just personally, uh, every place I've worked, every appointment I've had, I've um, involved NARF or dragged them along. <laughs> Uh, kicking and screaming, <laughs> please do this, please do that. And we've um, uh, done pretty magic things and created a revolution in museology, uh, um, created the National Museum of the American Indian, uh, built some fabulous institutions. And I'm very proud of the five and a half years I worked with NARF uh, as legislative liaison. <coughs> And part of that was that inside NARF, there was a core group of people, uh, starting with Tom Fredericks and, and, and also with John Eckerhawk, uh, working to respect and recognize the rights of traditional people. Uh, we began a coalition in 1967 at Bear Butte um, that that led to repatriation law, that led to the Museum of the American Indian, and, and lots of changes uh, led to the American Indian Religious Freedom Act. Uh, and, and we really worked in a concerted way and, and worked our way all around Indian country after that. And a lot of us were outlaws when we practiced our own ceremonies, when we practiced our own we used to tunnel underneath barbed wire or cut barbed wire in order to get to the Cheyenne part of Bear Butte. And uh, at one point, the farmer came over and said, use the gate. <laughs> 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 and, it, <laughs> and he ended up being such a friend that he gave, when he wanted to cash out and go to Florida, he gave the Cheyennes the first right of refusal um, for the 120 acres he had of Bear Butte. And, and we ended up, the Secretary of Interior ended up buying it for us and um, you know, taking it into trust for the Cheyenne Arapaho tribes and all others who have traditionally used Bear Butte. But that's the, the kind of history that, that we were dealing with individually and being sort of inside, outside the law. So I, I felt uh, that there were people in NARF that I could really depend on um, who understood that Native people's attachment to the land is something more than a catchphrase. But a lot of time, uh, people don't unpack that and don't understand it, that our attachment to the land is attachment to our ancestors, attachment to place, attachment to the waterfall where we saw that vision, attachment to uh, a migration history, uh, a, an attachment to a, a diaspora uh, where we have a place where we gather certain kinds of um, natural products uh, and, and where we find and develop and make sacred objects. Uh, all of these are what's kind of thrown into that attachment to place. And <clears throat> it's a blending of practical, uh, we're, the, we're the descendants of the people who made these treaties 
forest, for example, and they were nothing but practical. They were everything but practical, uh, including being practical. And so we, we are a blend of that practicality and spirituality and magic. Uh, my emblem for floating place is, is the uh, uh, snake doctor. Uh, I don't know who first called the dragonfly the snake doctor, but um, uh, the snake doctor is what, what a lot of the Native nations in Oklahoma commonly know uh, the dragonfly to be. And our Cheyenne people and our Muscogee people really depend on, 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 on the dragonfly for certain kinds of images of migration, <coughs> of um, survival, <coughs> and of repatriation because the uh, dragonfly has two sets of wings, one for one for carrying prayers uh, to the people uh, and all the beings on Mother Earth and the other uh, to transport people to the next world. Um, when our, and then on the Cheyenne side, our great prophet, uh, Sweet Medicine, when he went to Bear Butte before we moved uh, to the West, he went as many different things as a kit fox and, and other things, but he went one time as a, butter, as a dragonfly. Um, it, so our, and lots of other nations, uh, cultures have that kind of imagery of beings that, that shimmer us into transformative existence and who remind us of place and how we can change. And even for those of us who have, whose ancestors were wrenched from our homelands uh, and, and plopped down someplace else uh, without authority, without legal uh, uh, authority to, for that to be done to us, uh, this snake doctor is uh, one of those images that, that says you can get along any place. You can do it any place. So um, those are the thoughts I have right now. And I want to um, really thank NARF and especially um, Tom Fredericks and John Echohawk and Tom Tureen, who should be here, uh, for their guidance and their leadership. Uh, when I was, during the Carter Mondale transition, when I was responsible for um, doing final selection and vetting of, of uh, different people in political positions, uh, I had a telephone call with, with John Echohawk and Tom Fredericks and said, okay, Here's the thing, we have a chance to have the very first associate uh, solicitor for Indian Affairs who's native. Which one of you wants to be that person? <laughs> and there was just silence. <clears throat> and John said, the only thing I've ever wanted to be is the director of NARC. And Tom said, good, because I want to be associate solicitor <laughs> for him. <laughs> so it was the greatest deal than the one I've ever been involved in. <laughs> so I want to publicly thank the, those uh, two for being um, partners in, in uh, uh, sometimes uh, outlaws and partners in, in uh, law and crime. Thanks, Suzanne. Uh, Chairman Gentry, would you like to weigh in on the importance of land to climate tribes? Sure. I was thinking about how to uh, 
speak about this. I'm a little bit uncomfortable uh, trying to speak for all indigenous peoples or all tribes. It's a little bit awkward that way, but I think I've made some observations and had some understandings that may be pretty universal amongst natives in terms of their view on land and water and all the resources associated with those. And, uh, some of these things uh, we could talk a little bit more when we talk specifically about the Klamath tribes from our, our perspective, but uh, it's, I think it's pretty commonly understood uh, how deeply tied that we are uh, spiritually, emotionally, uh, physically uh, uh, to, to the lands, you know, and I think it comes from, you know, uh, our creation stories, you know, our creator placed us there, you know, he had plans and purposes for our peoples, he had plans and purposes for the very things that uh, are, are in our homelands, you know, and uh, those things have shaped our culture and our in our in our views. Uh, I've thought about our people, you know, we've been uh, one uh, kind of uh, quasi ethnographic person characterized us as the people of Thule and Stone, because we're so associated with the marshes and the lakes, and and a lot of our uh, tools are made out of stone, and we have some unique stone tools that we use for grinding the locusts. <coughs> which is a seed uh, from uh, a plant that grows in the marsh. It was one of our main staples. And, uh, but, and we also use the tule and so forth. So in our case, since we were so tied to that, a lot of our culture, a lot of our stories, uh, a lot of our ceremonies uh, that we observed before we gathered the locusts, before we caught our, our twam, our cup to our fish, you know, uh, uh, we're so tied to those things that Creator uh, place there for us. And uh, people of the plains, of course, the bison, the buffalo, you know, so much of their culture and, uh, and the things that they taught their people were, were centered around that, uh, the ethics, the values uh, uh, around uh, taking what you need and, and using what you take. And, and uh, so I, it, wherever I go, I, I see that that seems to be pretty universal, that our people are so tied to the land. Uh, they believe that they're placed there for a purpose, and there's something spiritual and uh, powerful about that. And, uh, and uh, folks even believe that if we're not honored for those people of that land and, and respected for the stewards, and, and we're more than stewards too, I believe, uh, the people that Creator placed us uh, to be, and to, if we're not honored in, uh, in the manner that we need to, and the resources there and the homelands aren't honored in the way that they need to, things are broken. And uh, I, f I believe our native people see that everywhere. We see the social injustice, you know, because we know what's right and what should be right in terms of the land and the water. You know how that affects our resources and uh, that's why we feel so strongly as we, we do about protecting uh, wildlife, uh, protecting the, the resources, protecting the earth and the water. Everything that's there, it's a, it's a it's a holistic uh, uh, worldview. Uh, I have a friend who call, calls it a community of creation. You know, we're a part of that uh, as native people. We're a part of all creation: uh, the trees, the rocks, the water, everything that's in existence. We're a part of uh, the animals. We fit in, and uh, most often we don't think of ourselves as stewards, maybe in some respects, but we're a part of things. Things take care of themselves sometimes, you know. And uh, I just know some things that I've learned from our people. For example, when we collect uh, the eggs on the marsh, the duck eggs or the goose eggs, uh, you know, we'd leave, we'd take a few and, and leave quite a few in the nest, you know. So, so we, that's the way that we live and that's the way Native people live. So our connection to the land and water is so deep. And uh, I think that we're even suffering sickness and um, emotional and uh, social issues because of the things that have happened to the land and have happened to our people. Thanks, Chairman. <clears throat> um, do others want to weigh in on that? I think that's a good um, framework to set us up to, to talk more about protecting that relationship. And, and so with that, I want to turn to um, Don Miller uh, so much of your work has um, involved tribal claims to Aboriginal lands and restoring title to those lands. And so I just wanted to ask you, um, in your experience, 
how have your clients felt about and described their relationship to their homeland? And then also if um, in making those, those legal Aboriginal title claims, were there any legal or other challenges you uh, came across in making those? Well, if, if Chairman Gentry was uncomfortable speaking for all of <laughs> <laughs> all indigenous people, I certainly am, uh, uh, don't feel qualified to talk about how my clients felt about uh, the land and the water. Uh, I, uh, you know, what, what did they say about it? Well, I, I, you know, I can only say they didn't say much. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, it was something that a white kid from the city just you either picked up on it or you didn't. Uh, I'm not sure I really picked up on it all that much, but uh, you know, one of the things that you, that you didn't didn't mention, and, and I don't talk a lot about it, but um, my legal career started in Klamath Falls with the Klamath Indians, um, and I had gone to school with law school here with uh, with Tom Fredericks and. I had gotten to know Dan Israel uh, fairly well, and uh, when I got out of law school, uh, I didn't have a job. Uh, I was hanging around in Boulder just taking a, wor a job uh, uh, working for Mayflower Trucking Company on the, on the docks when NARF uh, said, hey, you know, there's this tribe out in Oregon that needs a lawyer. Uh, there's going to be a big distribution of money. And there have been uh, uh, a lot of, there's been a lot of abuse of trustees, trusteeships and guardianship. Uh, we need, a, they need a lawyer to go out and, uh, and look at this. And so I went in uh, not having any experience in Indian affairs at all. Talked to some people at NARF. Uh, they stamped approved on my uh, on my forehead and and <laughs> sent us off to Oregon. And when Cindy and I got in that Volkswagen to go to Oregon, we didn't know whether Oregon was the one next to Canada or the one next to California. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we I still don't know. Uh, <laughs> We went to Wyoming and took a left. Uh, and the first Indian people that I, you know, in, in an Indian community that, uh, that I'd ever dealt with at all were the Klamath Indians. And, you know, I'm probably lucky that I was pretty much a blank slate. Uh, <laughs> didn't, didn't have a, a, a lot of attitudes one way or the other. And so whatever I picked up on was from the, the openness and the generosity and the, uh, uh, the welcoming arms of the Klamath people. There was no Klamath tribe at the time. Um, when I got to Oregon, I found out that I was going to be the first executive director of a small community action agency that some Klamath Indians had organized to, to fill the void after termination. And our task was to try to get some sort of program going um, for legal assistance for uh, Indian education, for uh, alcohol and substance abuse, programs to deal with the tremendous socioeconomic upheaval caused by termination. And in the course of that, um, I suppose I learned enough to, to get me by uh, in working in land, Indian land and water matters. But 
you know, I, it's, it's certainly not, uh, not my place to, to talk about the, uh, you know, the, the fundamental deep connection that I know exists. But um, I, I think I've just been fortunate to play some part in trying to follow in the footsteps of people like David Getches and Charles Wilkinson and uh, learn what, uh, uh, what they've been teaching and use that to, to, uh, in litigation on behalf of Indian people. In making um, claims, aboriginal title claims, um, were there certain legal challenges you faced? I mean, a lot of tribes, uh, of course, maintain relationships to their aboriginal lands, even though they may not have technically have title to them. Um, but of course, there's claims to be made, which you know, part of your work was um, making claims to aboriginal lands. And um, were there any uphill battles you had to overcome in, in those types of cases? Well, I think the fact that that the the major land claim cases that I worked on uh, all took um, 20 years or more to resolve would suggest that there were some <laughs> there were a few obstacles. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's hard to, to represent tribes in water cases, but if you, if you represent tribes in land claim cases, particularly in the 1960s and the 1970s, I mean, you had to go into those communities. You had to wear a red wig and a mustache just to, you know, there were, uh, those were different times. When we went to Klamath Falls, uh, initially, we were being followed by FBI agents. Um, and uh, the same was true when we, when we went to South Carolina to uh, begin working uh, on the Catawba land claim. And uh, the challenges were, um, were enormous because the political opposition is so, so great. And, um, you know, I, I pretty quickly came to the view that these land claim cases were essentially political cases. They had to have a political resolution. And to just engage the local political forces um, and even to get them to, to talk about uh, the, the, the preposterous idea to them that the Indians could have any remaining rights whatsoever. Um, those efforts took three, four years just by themselves to, of just constant talking and meeting with people. And because we didn't go into court and and say, and, and just sue the states and the landowners right away. We did the research and we said, well, we think that we've got a good claim here. Let's go talk to the governor. Let's go talk to the county commissioner. Let's see if we can, and we couldn't. No interest whatsoever. Well, okay, let's, See in court, and it was um, it was something that the, the court battles went well until, as Tom Frederick said, about the mid 1980s, when things started going south, and then, of course, um, if the courts aren't going to do their job and interpret the law, and they're going to get into this equitable balancing uh, in the early stages of a case, then that, that 
cuts the legs out from under the tribes and reduces their political leverage. And so the challenges that, that, that we faced, I mean, we saw it in the, in the Fourth Circuit uh, where initially with one group of judges, we were winning the, uh, uh, the Reagan appointee, appointees came in, uh, we started losing. And so when you're in a settlement context and your leverage is getting chipped away, mm -hmm. then what they, what they go for are the jurisdictional concessions. And um, so our clients were forced into uh, a number of jurisdictional concessions that were just, um, well, unfortunate. So. Thank you. Uh, do others want to comment or weigh in on the the land claims issue, I know I think Suzanne, may, you may have worked with Pass McQuaddy in Penobscot in Maine, um, or if others have any comments on the, that topic as well. Well, and I <clears throat> was fortunate enough to, to work with Don Miller and um, uh, on the Catawba claim, and his very... Um, apparent humility and modesty really helped avert several outright wars. I mean, guns were drawn, and um, there, was, there were lots of weapons, and people were facing off um, between the, the people who, who wanted money and the people who wanted land and Don represented the people who wanted land, and the others we called the cash onlys or cash onlys. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and we were, uh, so he averted a, 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 literally a shootout uh, in one set of meetings, and, and um, then the next morning we all went our separate ways and, and um, I was driving from Rock Hill, South Carolina to Chapel Hill, North Carolina to meet up with my husband and, and children and um, then drive on to Washington, D.C. So I'm driving in a rental car and, and there's a highway patrol behind me and I would speed up and they would speed up and I would slow down and they would slow down. I would turn and, and it was clear that they were tailing me. So one thing I had to do before I left was to, uh, the, the Catawba people wanted me to go and, and just take a little bit of clay from the Catawba River where that's where they get the, the clay, the mud, to make those beautiful Catawba pots. And so I went under the bridge, got my clay, came out, and there were the highway patrolmen waiting for me. And so I was really furious, and so I puffed up as large as I could, <clears throat> make myself, and, and uh, stomped over to, to their car and said, why are you following me? <laughs> the, the governor's office directed us to escort you to <laughs> Is it safely to the border? <laughs> oh, 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 the Congress, the good congressman who represented, uh, apparently had given, uh, uh, asked the governor to, to give us all protection. And, and um, mine was just more apparent. And I, took, <laughs> I thought it was something else. Anyway, they were lovely. And we had a great laugh. And finally, I said, I'm so sorry. And uh, began to walk off. And they said, can we ask you what you were doing under the bridge? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just wanted to give you a flavor of the times and, and how um, difficult it was for, for the NARC lawyers to navigate 
um, uh, this uh, these uh, as as uh, well the 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 difficult settlements, uh, the unfortunate settlements, the the fortunate settlements, um, the Hasmaquatis and Penobscots really wanted a focus in in this you know money and and uh, and real estate uh, deal on culture and their respect for Mount Katahdin, even though they weren't claiming Mount Katahdin, they wanted it noted that Mount Katahdin was, was a sacred mountain. And uh, so the, the entire um, group that, that was the uh, litigation group was uh, really focused on that and spent a lot of time talking about it, as much time as, as they had taken uh, in talking about other things that you would think were, were more, uh, uh, should have been more prominent in their minds. But that was, that was a huge thing to them. And um, uh, it, when the Justice Department uh, in 1976 announced that, uh, that the Pasmaquatis and Penobscots had a good, good and valid claim and they were and they were filing suit and and had done so uh, U.S. v. Maine, uh, but at the request of the Passamaquoddy and Penobscot peoples, they were holding the the uh, action in abeyance pending the outcome of settlement talks. Now all of this was a ruse because we didn't have any settlement talks, but they were giving us space to have some settlement talks. And uh, Tom Terrain was really. Um, uh, 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 he, he, uh, he sprinkled some, some magic dust and um, uh, created settlement talks and we in, uh, got to engage people who understood how important this was to the people, to the native people. Um, Archibald Cox, uh, uh, we asked if he could uh, help us, if he, he would lend his name even. And he thought about it for a while and called back and said, look, I, I, I can't, um, I, I'm at Harvard and I'm, I'm really busy this semester, so I, I can only give you half my time and I'll do it on a pro bono basis. So that's the kind of commitment that was, that was being given because of NARF's character and because of the attachment that the native people had to the lands. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, talking a little bit about land, I now want to turn and talk uh, about water as well. And I know uh, Professor Anderson, um, as a litigator and an academic, a lot of your work has been focused on tribal water rights. And so maybe you could tell us a little bit about the importance of water to our native communities and then also um, whether or not you have an impression about whether tribes are, how they're doing in protecting their water, water rights, and the quality of their water as well. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. I'll try to. Um, <laughs> I'm going to do something I almost never do, which is to talk about my own feelings. My wife sometimes says, how are you? And I kind of feel like it's kind of a personal question. <laughs> We've only known each other for 30 years. Um, so I'm going to step out of that, my usual character, and talk about um, just my feelings. And, you know, I'm a Boys Fort Ojibwe uh, band member in northern Minnesota, but I moved away from home where I grew up uh, in our Aboriginal territory when I was 17 and went to college and then to law school. and. And Charles Wilkinson told me to come here as a law clerk, and I worked at NARF and moved to Alaska. And this year I've taken time off for the first time, and uh, I've been back in that area living in our cabin where, where I grew up and uh, thinking of, and working on the tribal appellate court a little bit and thinking about how Anishinaabe people moved down the Great Lakes in the 1600s and settled in northern Minnesota and uh, southern Ontario where wild rice and fish were abundant and, and game, and I've been spending a lot of time in the woods and thinking about, as, as Suzanne mentioned, you know, what happened before and thinking about if I would have gone there in 1620, would I have seen people out in canoes and villages that are 
You see remnants of them all over the place. And in that part of the world, water quantity is not uh, a, a real issue. Uh, it's now becoming a quality issue, and it is everywhere in Indian country. And there are mining companies that uh, were there mining iron ore years ago, and now they're back looking for uh, copper, nickel deposits uh, with sulfide mining that threatens to uh, uh, destroy wild rice beds, uh, invade groundwater aquifers, uh, and, uh, you know, has the potential of lasting for thousands and thousands of years, as we see with a lot of the mining in the West. And so, you know, thinking about how to protect water quality is something that, you know, has not received a great deal of attention, uh, except when it's typically when it's too late, when there's a Superfund site because of mining activity on a river system. Uh, and tribes uh, have done more and more in recent years uh, with the assistance of the Environmental Protection Agency to become sovereign regulators of uh, waters in their territory. Uh, and there's more and more interest in that, I think, as water becomes more scarce. Uh, the idea that in the West that dilution can be the solution for pollution is, is false. And so the, on the water quality angle, there's a huge amount of work to be done. Uh, and I've been doing a little bit academically and with some tribes on that in, in, in the West. Uh, the uh, uh, question of uh, water uh, quantities is, and, and how tribes are doing, I, I want to say, well, there's 29 Indian water settlements that have been enacted in the last 30 years. Uh, they probably involve about 50 tribes or so, and, and they've been, you know, uh, varying degrees of success, but they've, on balance, you know, helped secure steady water supplies and uh, uh, other assets to, to tribes, but when you think about it in a, in a broader context, um, you get into these lawsuits that NARF has filed uh, repeatedly uh, and other lawyers or lawyers that left NARF, uh, and you know, the, the position that we're in in these cases is kind of ridiculous because from the tribal perspective, it's all right, there's this, we have this reservation and these water resources that we're basically siphoned off by the United States Bureau of Reclamation in many cases for non-Indian use, miles away from the reservation, out of the watershed. Uh, it's origin, Aboriginal tribal property, uh, and now the tr it's been stolen, essentially, and you get to you negotiate about how much you're going to get back. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, I, I, when I worked for the United States government, I did a lot of water stuff uh, for Secretary Babbitt and uh, and with the Justice Department, and, and sometimes, uh, you know, we go to meet with tribes, and the uh, uh, people with me who didn't know much about Indian country would say, why are these, they're yelling at us, we're here to help, we're on their side, we brought this lawsuit. <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> all right, I, I'm glad you're laughing, I don't have to say any more. <laughs> um, you know, so the United States has brought a lot of litigation, NARF has been key uh, in, you know, bringing that litigation. And uh, the, the importance of the work that NARF has done and continues to do is, is tremendous, but there's so much to be done uh, in the era of climate change. People are always trying to grab the water back, even when the tribe gets it. Uh, and once somebody else starts using it, even if they acknowledge that it's yours, it's hard to get it back. Uh, and so, you know, the, it's, it's uh, a constant battle uh, and one that will never end. Um, and I think that NARF has shown the way in terms of the, uh, uh, the persistence uh, in maintaining the litigation uh, despite turnover on staff and uh, uh, temporary defeats. Uh, you know, the Pyramid Lake litigation is, is remarkable. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's just uh, something that's uh, not going to stop. And because uh, uh, water is important for physical, economic, sustenance, but for spiritual uh, and cultural importance as well. I mean, I've just, being home for this last few months, I've never felt so <coughs> peaceful, you know, mm -hmm. just to be back there. And uh, I, but I have to say one little story here about coming to NARF is that after, when I came here as an attorney, I, I sat down with John Echohawk my first day, and he said uh, I was going to work on the San Luis Rey case uh, in California, and that 
And Jeannie Whiting talked me into coming, cutting off my time after the bar exam because <laughs> this water case was really moving along fast. And I was naive enough to believe her. It's still going on <laughs> 30, 32 years later. Uh, but I, I sat in John's office, and you know, John is you know, pretty unflappable. And he, and he showed it that day to me. He said, uh, have you taken water law? And I said, no. He said, well, Indian law. I said, no. And he goes, OK, you're going to go. <laughs> he says, you got your Cohen handbook. <laughs> And I had worked here the summer before, but then, uh, you know, I, I, got, I started working on these water cases uh, and then got to Alaska and met uh, uh, Katie John, our first client, and uh, worked for 30 years on that case in various capacities along with Heather Kendall. Uh, we thought we won it in the Supreme Court last year uh, and when they denied a review and we won this this, hunt, this fishing case based on the Federal Reserve Water Rights Doctrine only because we knew about it because we were NARF lawyers, because we had learned about this uh, and because of NARF's existence. And now it's back in the Supreme Court uh, and we're struggling to, to stay with that. And it's, you know, it, it's, you know, I still consider myself a NARF attorney first and foremost and it's the thing I'm proudest of because everything I've ever done, if, it's, if, if I've done anything, it's been because of what I learned here at NARF really uh, warms my heart to be here. Thanks, Professor Anderson. And, and Steve, uh, Professor Anderson uh, mentioned the Federal Reserve Water Rights Doctrine, and um, historically it's, it's applied to surface water. Um, but maybe you could talk a little bit about your work in Agua and, and some developments there um, with the Reserve Rights Doctrine. Sure, thanks, Matt. And, uh, it's great to be here and great to see uh, old friends, new friends, uh, NARF supporters. Um, and, and I can blame something on uh, Bob Anderson. Uh, he's not going to come away unscathed uh, uh, today. <laughs> uh, I had managed through the first 15 years of my career to avoid uh, being saddled with an Indian water rights uh, case. Um, but in about 1994, when Bob moved to Alaska, uh, to, to thinking that he would escape his water docket, um, didn't, didn't quite work out. I ended up with Don Miller inheriting his work on the Nez Perce litigation and settlement. Um, and, and much of my career uh, then in the last 20 years has involved water rights. and. Uh, yeah, th there's a lot that we could say. We could occupy three or four days just talking about Indian reserved water rights. Um, we are involved in a very important case uh, in the Central District of California. Uh, the first phase of it is on in interlocutory appeal to the Ninth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals on behalf of the Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians uh, living essentially in downtown Palm Springs. Um, the case really is about an unremarkable, I would think, uh, proposition, and that is a, a desert-dwelling tribe uh, would have a right to access uh, all available water sources uh, to fulfill the purposes of the creation of their reservation. Now, the Agua Caliente, like a lot of uh, Indian people, have very deep spiritual connections to, to water and to the land. and. Um, the, the history of Agua Caliente is, is, is really wonderful uh, to, to have learned about the last five years. And uh, they were one of two um, indigenous populations in the desert part of, of the Western Hemisphere that actually had d developed the capability of hand digging their own wells. They had learned over time watching the animals that there was water underground. And, and they would, by hand, dig wells and follow the depth of the water table uh, as it would rise and fall in the Coachella Valley down by just continuing to dig deeper and deeper uh, wells. And the stairs would go in a circular fashion around uh, the outside of the well. Uh, that would enable them to, to um, live in parts of the, the valley that were not close to the mountain. Uh, it would enable them to capture and, and store water uh, for those village sites and then and for hunting and migration uh, around uh, that part of the world. Um, 
So there is the centuries-old history of developing groundwater uh, in the valley. Um, the two water districts, of course, uh, defend in part their, their uh, case uh, on the fact that the tribe they assert has never developed groundwater. Um, and they're very careful about it within the boundaries of the current reservation. Well, most of the current reservation is closer to the mountains. And so, you know, we have to play with, with those kinds of mind games and those kinds of strategies in, in this kind of litigation. Um, I, I think that, and, and, and we did prevail before the, the, the judge that we have in the Central District of California, Judge Bernal. Uh, he's born in Mexico, educated uh, at Harvard, uh, excuse me, Yale Law School. Sorry not to, not to offend some people in the room, I hope, but uh, uh, Yale Law School graduate. Um, and at oral argument, um, and, and we had the, the four parties, the U.S. intervened, at oral argument uh, after f rounds of briefs, three rounds of briefs by four parties, um, multiple briefs, on these kinds of nuanced issues, walked into the courtroom after weeks of preparation, and we had a 20-minute hearing. The judge, three days later, issued his, his ruling, a 20-page opinion, um, finding this unremarkable proposition, again, as I said, that a de desert-dwelling tribe should have access to, to groundwater. Uh, this is an issue that cuts across all of Indian country. Uh, many tribes, uh, not only in the desert southwest, but throughout the Midwest, uh, tribes in the Pacific Northwest that are worried about saltwater intrusion uh, into their reservations, uh, reservation aquifers are concerned about groundwater. And so this is a, a very important issue that's on appeal to the Ninth Circuit. And if anyone wants to talk to me about participation as amicus uh, tribal uh, groups, uh, please see me today. Um, I mean, at bottom, I think the last thing that I want to say right now, uh, and I know we're trying to hold the audience uh, through the beginning of lunch, um, <clears throat> ultimately we are talking about land and water here. You know, the stakes are incredibly high. The non-Indian settlers that moved in uh, and through the reclamation laws and the homesteading laws um, and the work of the federal government, as Bob said, in stealing these resources away from Indian tribes, non-Indians uh, uh, took on this arrogant assumption that these are their resources. Um, flat out wrong, and you know, a lot of us in this room have spent our careers uh, trying to um, um, knock down that, that proposition um, and, and to begin to reassert these important property title questions and issues for, for Indian tribes. Um, a, just a quick personal story, um, like, like Don, a uh, city-dwelling boy, I can't pretend to... Same city. Same city, <laughs> God forbid. I, I, I can't pretend to, to understand the, deep, the depth of the appreciation and connection of Native peoples to the land uh, and the water, but... Um, and I was a VISTA volunteer, Ada, for the first year out of law school. Um, David Getch has got me my first job, and... Uh, and I, I'll start crying if I start thinking of talking about David much um, in northern Idaho. And, and about a month after I, I moved up there, I went to a meeting of some Kootenai Indians who were involved in fighting uh, a dam and hydroelectric project in northwest Montana at Kootenai Falls. Um, long story short, we, we uh, <clears throat> had a 13-week trial before a FERC administrative law judge. We won that case. I, I got Walter... Echo Hawk involved, um, got NARF involved, uh, Doug Anderson, who was a NARF attorney now at Sanoski, was involved. Uh, we had a hell of a run, and, and after 10 years, we prevailed before FERC, uh, and, and the electric co-ops uh, not decided not to take an appeal to the, the Court of Appeals. Um, we had, and I, I think you talk about moments in time when cases are won or lost, uh, we had a, a, a judge from, an administrative law judge from the East Coast uh, residing in Virginia. Uh, we decided to have a site tour at the Kootenai Falls. Um, there's a, a storage project, Libby Dam, above Kootenai Falls, about 10 miles, and we um, 
got the cooperation of the Corps of Engineers to turn the water off uh, in the river uh, and to bring it down to almost a trickle. And, um, and I had never been out here, but uh, a dear friend of mine, Patrick Lefthand, who was a NARF board member, he's no longer with us. Patrick Lefthand was a, a medicine man, a Kootenai medicine man. Um, and we crawled out on the rocks in, that made up the waterfall. And, uh, and Pat, <clears throat> we took the judge under the rock ledges that made up the waterfall. And under those rock ledges, there were red ochre markings where the Kootenai people had vision quested for centuries. So that gives you, that's just one small story about the, the depth of connection, uh, the temporal uh, and spiritual depth of connection to a place, a sacred place. So while I, I don't have that personal intimate connection, you know, and, and I know Don would have to admit this, you know, he's absorbed or, or taken on, assimilated some of those feelings from, from his, his years of working with uh, Native people, so thanks. Thanks, Steve. And uh, I know we had a lot of ground we wanted to cover, but I think uh, we've been asked to try and get a little bit back on schedule. So um, I don't know if we have time to stand for questions or if we want to have concluding remarks, two minutes. So if, we have, if there's questions out there, I think we have time for some. Yes. <laughs> Not that much older than me. Well, I, let me just say, it. that's the work that has to be done, and I really appreciated Melody McCoy's uh, <coughs> presentation about the uh, education sovereignty work that's being done, which is critical in, in the tribal colleges that are out there. And, uh, you know, it's really tremendous progress. And just one final word about land and the disaster that we call the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act with the separation of land ownership from the tribes. Uh, in the establishment of the corporations uh, and the taking away of federal protection for hunting and fishing rights for, as a tribal right, 
uh, is something that's uh, really uh, strikes at the heart of uh, everything that NARF fights for. And I'm so glad that NARF has got that four lawyer office up there to work on these issues. And it's going to need, they're going to need more. I'll just answer real briefly. Sure. Uh, from my from my perspective, I, I think, uh, and we're doing that, and I see, the tribe, see tribes across the nation, you know, we're becoming more, ac actually taking our place in the rightful place in our communities. You know, we're standing up for what's right and what's ours and should have been uh, recognized and honored. And uh, just uh, establishing relationships with folks in government, you know, it's been uh, many years, uh, it hasn't been safe to, uh, as an Indian to have an opinion in your own community. We're so marginalized and, and oppressed in our own community. But as we stand up, and I know through our, our water rights issues and, uh, and the settlement actions, which I believe, I, I, and I thank NARF so much for enabling us to be in the strong position that we are in this time, knowing that we're still in the process of adjudication that can go on for many years without settlement. And we're able to address some of these issues, water quality issues, which you just don't address through a water adjudication. But through the settlement, through relationship, through standing up uh, and protecting what is ours, you know, um, uh, I, I, I think that that's a, a big part of it, you know, communication. I've actually had people in the community ask me, you know, what is this deal about termination? You know, they think of us as being willing sellouts and so forth. And I'm able to share with those folks, and we're able to do that in uh, so relationships and uh, realizing that our neighbors are, are our neighbors. Um, I mean, it was traditional for us to welcome our neighbors. I mean, it might have been to our, our detriment for, in a sense, but, you know, I always remember what w we were taught, you know, that if uh, the only thing that we had to share with our neighbor when they came to visit it with us as a flea, we'd share that flea. That's the heart of our people, I think, Native people. And, uh, and I think that goes the long way as we stand up for what is right and what is ours and continue to work to protect those things. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you to the panelists. lunch upstairs in the cafe on the second floor. Um, you can take the stairs or there's an elevator um, down the long hallway here on the first floor. I don't know that this one worked. I didn't seem like it. Oh, yeah, no, I had it on, but I was tapping it. <laughs>